wanted to say something about web browsers, dev tools, and the, uh, the pieces of software you need in order to be a web developer. And we, we talk about the web platform. You're going to see this term as you start reading documentation about web development. And I wanted to spend just a minute thinking about what that means and also what you need to do to set up to be successful as a, as a web developer. So web browsers are insanely complicated. They are probably some of the most complicated software that exists today. And you may not think of them as, um, as complicated as they are because they don't reveal a lot of their parts. They, most of what they do is invisible. So I wanted to try and make some of that visible to you right now. So the best definition I've heard of what a web browser is, and uh, I want you to use it as a starting point for thinking about what we're doing is that a web browser is a virtual machine for running untrusted code. So really, what does that mean? A, a browser is a computer and it's designed for running a specific kind of software. So let me show you what I mean, just a couple of examples. I have a browser open here and I have a number of tabs already open. So in this tab, I'm running a version of uh, Linux. In this tab, I've got a version of Windows running. And in this tab over here, I've got Doom 3 running, all of them in the same browser all separated from each other. And I wanted to show you these because we don't tend to think of, we don't tend to think of, a, we think about web pages. What is a web page? It's a bunch of text, some images, maybe a video, but um, a, web, a web page can also be, you know, can be any kind of code that you can write, whether that's like a video game, like Doom 3, or an operating system like Linux, it can be something very, very complex. And what a browser does is it provides this platform on top of which we can build whatever kind of software that we need to, to build in order, you know, in whatever we want to run, essentially. So I'll close these down just so I don't have to compete with them in, the, in what I'm doing here. So what a browser does is it implements all of the open standards or most of the open standards of the web and the internet. So a browser implements things like parsers, decoders, compilers, layout engines, rendering engines, font, uh, font drawing uh, engines, etc. So all of the underlying pieces of technology you need in order to be able to render text, to be able to parse, XML, HTML, in order to execute JavaScript, all of those sorts of things. So browsers, they also provide hundreds and hundreds of APIs for developers to use covering things like uh, networking and graphics, 2D graphics, 3D graphics, sound, video, working with sensors, connecting with social media sites for sharing, all, just all kinds of things that you'd want to be able to do. So you can think of the web platform as an imaginary computer and operating system that's been implemented and it's been implemented uh, slightly differently by many companies. So an interesting aspect of the web platform is that there is no single implementation of it. So if you think of um, much of the software that you use, there's only one implementation of it. Some company writes a piece of software and then they sell that software, or they make it available, and, and that's it. That's all it is. The web is different. The web is this set of standards, and the standards are documents that lay out exactly how things are supposed to work, and then various companies can come along and they can implement them. So I wanted to show you just um, you know examples of what I'm talking about. And I wanted to start um, by looking at a couple of charts. So I have a chart here that shows web browser market share from 2009 to today. And what you're seeing here, I don't know if you can see the colors of these lines, but over here on the left, you're seeing at its height, Internet Explorer, Microsoft Internet Explorer, with about 64% of 
usage, like so 64% of people browsing the web were using Internet Explorer. And there may still be some people using Internet Explorer. Hopefully you're not one of them because this browser, as you can see, has had this precipitous decline and it's no longer um, it's no longer even recommended by Microsoft. So um, but this is this is one of the browsers which once upon a time was the most popular browser on the Internet. And in this list, you're going to see other browsers, for example, Firefox. You can see Firefox here at its peak was somewhere in the, you know, a third of um, a third of web traffic was coming from coming from Firefox. This green that you see going from 2% up to 69% is Chrome. And I'm currently running inside of Chrome right now. Probably you're running Chrome. 62% of the of people on the web are running Chrome. So that's a lot, but as you can see, it's not the entire web. And I also want you to notice how these top contenders, they change position. So right now, Chrome is on top. Will Chrome always be on top? I don't know. Um, at one point, it looked like Microsoft would always be on top. So what else do we have in here? We have lots of other browsers, like we have Safari. So lots of people who run a Mac use Safari. And you can see that they have you know 8% of web traffic right now here. On desktop, you can see Microsoft's new browser, Edge, coming in here at 5%, etc. And there's lots of little browsers. There's even more than what are listed here, Opera at 2%. And there's hundreds and hundreds of little purpose-built browsers, browsers that, for example, you might have um, a set-top box for your television or a smart TV, and your smart TV might have a browser in it. Those browsers have a small market share, but they still exist. There's all sorts of things like these browsers like this that are built into different devices and so on. Now on mobile, we have a slightly different story. So here is the mobile web. Once again, you can see Chrome is very, very high due to Android. So, you know, you probably have an Android phone or you have an iOS device. If you're running on iOS, you can see this gray line here is Safari. And the mobile web is ruled by Chrome and Safari. These two browsers uh, are the most important browsers for the mobile web. And some would argue for the web in general because most people today, when they browse the web, they do it on a phone. So when you're, when you're thinking about how to target users, you know, you have to keep in mind that there isn't one particular device that everybody uses. Or sorry, there isn't. Well, yeah, that's true. But there, are, there isn't one particular browser that everybody uses when, um, when they're, you know, when they're making a choice to look at something. They're using any number of of browsers. So why is this important for you as a web developer? It means that you have to write code on your machine, and then when you deploy it, when people install it, they're going to run it on any number of combinations of operating systems and browsers. So that means that somebody could be running your code in Safari on desktop. Somebody else could be running your code on Android on um, Chrome. Somebody else could be using Opera. Somebody else could be using, uh, you know, Firefox, etc. So for you as a web developer, what you need to do is you need to install as many browsers as you possibly can in order to keep up with this. So right now. Like I've got um, the notes for this week up web222.ca in running inside of Chrome, but I brought along a whole bunch of other browsers to think about. So I, here's a browser. This is the Firefox browser. And you should install Firefox on your machine. All right, what else should you install? Well, I'm on a Mac, so my Mac automatically comes with Safari. So here's the same page running inside of Safari. Um, there's, what else could I, what else could I work with? I'm, I've installed Microsoft's new browser. This is Edge and you can install Edge on Windows. You can install it on Mac. One of the problems with Safari is that you can't install Safari on Windows. So that's going to be a limitation you're going to have if you're working on Windows. You won't have access to it. Maybe you have access to uh, working with Safari in um, on a phone. I don't actually have an iPhone. I have an Android phone. But on my Mac, I have access to the iOS simulator. 
So here is the same web page running in iOS and in Safari on mobile. There's other browsers we could look at. So another browser that I really like is the Brave browser. And I tend to use Brave a lot. Brave is focused on privacy. And um, here, here's the exact same page running in Brave. I also have Opera installed. So Opera is an interesting browser, which is, I think, tailor-made for uh, developers and has a lot of extra features built into it. Um, so I have that installed on my machine. But browsers can look really different. So for example, here is the same page running in the Lynx browser. So this is a text-based browser that only runs in the console. So I've got all kinds of different uh, browsers running the same content here, which lets me test my code in all different ways. And what you're gonna find is that each one of these browsers has a different focus. Some of them are focused on performance. Uh, for, for example, Safari really focuses on battery life, trying to extend battery life. Some browsers are focused on privacy. So Firefox and Brave really try and uh, put user privacy and tracking protection ahead of other things. Um, Chrome, Edge, they all have different, different uh, strengths and weaknesses, and they all have different bugs. So every one of these implementations is imperfect, and there are thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of bugs that people are working on right now trying to fix these browsers to make them all work so they're all compatible. So what you can do, and what you should do this week, is you should go out and install every browser that you can possibly find that will work on your machine. So uh, you, know, you don't have to go and buy every mobile phone and so on, like probably you already have access to one of the two platforms, whether it's uh, Android or iOS. So it's good to have a mobile phone. It's good for you to then on desktop install all of the browsers that you can. And also, I haven't shown them here, but each one of these browsers has nightly versions or so the version that's coming soon is available um, available to you. The update cycle on these browsers is unbelievable. So every six weeks or so, they ship a new version. Your browser's constantly updating all the time. And so new features are coming to the web constantly. Old bugs are being fixed. And so there's a constant cycle of improvement that's going into the web platform. It's getting better and better all the time. So when we're thinking about um, coding against all of these browsers, and I tell you that each of the browsers has different strengths and weaknesses and they all have different bugs, I also want to make you aware that every browser implements things slightly differently on a different schedule, and some of them decide not to implement certain features. So there's a really great site that I use a lot, and you'll see me refer to it. It's called caniuse.com. And what it does is it keeps track of all the different APIs and standards and things that browsers implement, and it lets you check to see which browsers implement which features. So let me give you an example. If we were to say, for example, in, in a few weeks, we're going to be looking at how you host audio files in a web page. So what if I wanted to play an MP3 file on the web? So if I type in the MP3 file format, you can see it shows me a list of all different browsers across the top, IE, Edge, Firefox, Chrome, Safari, etc. And then it shows different versions. And it, it, if it's red, it means that it's not supported. And if it's green, it means that it is supported. So you can see that here, if I look at the global percentage of users who have access to MP3, you can see that it's about 97%. It's not everybody because there are people who use Opera Mini. That's another browser that I don't have. Uh, and it doesn't implement it. So even though it's good, it's not 100%, but it's very, very good. And um, let's try another format. There's a new... Uh, Uh, this is not going to work for some reason. Let me try again. There we go. So there's a new image format that I'll be talking about called WebP. WebP is a fantastic format for doing images on the web because it compresses them so small, it makes them faster to download. 
So if you take a look at the stats on WebP, you can see that it's well supported in Edge, Firefox, Chrome, Safari, but you can see that, for example, Internet Explorer, no version of Internet Explorer uh, supports it. And so up here, you can see that about 80% of browsers, 80% uh, of browsers support it. Or there's an even newer image format that's coming to the web, AVIF, and you can see that it's only supported in Chrome. So when you're thinking about, and it's only supported in like really um, future versions of Chrome, right? So older versions of Chrome that a lot of people are running don't have it, don't have it available yet. So can I use is really useful because it lets me look up as a web developer and see, okay, if I wanna work with a particular technology or I wanna work with a piece of the web platform, um, I wanna work with, geolocation information. So browsers let me um, interact with the GPS data on a phone, for example. And who supports it? Well, 97% of browsers support it, which is really good. So I can I can work with you know the geolocation API if I want to do something that uses uh, maps and so on um, on a user's device. This is a really handy tool for being able to understand what's what's available and what I should avoid or what's coming but hasn't made it all the way into um, into everybody's device. So step one, I want you to go and I want you to install every browser that works on your computer. And I would also recommend that on a regular basis, you rotate which browser you use. So some days use Firefox, some days use Chrome, some days use Edge. Try using all different browsers because your users are going to use all different browsers. And if you never test your code and you never try things out in another browser, you won't see that there are problems. And you're gonna find that one of the, one of the great things about the web is that nobody owns it. It's a set of open standards. Um, Anyone can build anything on it, but a downside of the web is that there are, there's no one in charge, there's no one implementation, there's all these differences, all these bugs between different browsers, and you as a developer have to deal with the fact that you know, there's, there's all these differences and you have to test everything many, many different ways. So another thing that I want to mention about these browsers is the fact that they all ship with really sophisticated developer tools. And we're going to spend a ton of time in the developer tools. And each one of the browsers has a different set of developer tools. So in Chrome, I get to the developer tools a couple of ways. If I click on this hamburger menu here and I go to more tools and to developer tools, I'll get into the developer tools here. Another way that I can get into the developer tools is to right click in a web page and go to the inspect option. Most browsers support this method of right clicking and saying inspect. And then I'm into the developer tools. And I'm gonna spend a lot of time showing you how to work with all of the different developer tools that are in here. And we'll talk about how to use them to investigate what's going on in a page, how to debug things, how to understand and take apart a web page, whether you wrote it or somebody else wrote it. So we're gonna to wanna to have different browsers because we're gonna to wanna to have uh, access to different developer tools. Okay, what else do you need? You need all these browsers, you need the developer tools. Another thing that you're going to need is you're gonna need access to a good terminal. Now, if you're on Mac as I'm on Mac, then I'm gonna use um, the terminal, I'm gonna use iTerm2 as the terminal that I use. If you're on Linux, probably your system already comes with a good terminal that you can work with. If you're on Windows, you need to install a good terminal. Um, and the one that I would recommend is inside of the Microsoft Store, Microsoft has currently been working on developing a new terminal. It's called the Windows Terminal, and it's free. And it is use, you can use it for CMD, for PowerShell, for WSL, for all different, different shells that you want to run. This terminal will be what you want to use. So a modern terminal has a lot of features that you're going to need to be able to work from the command line. And you might say to yourself, why, if I'm a web developer, why am I doing things at the command line? Well, we're gonna be working with the command line a lot in order to write web servers, in order to um, 
run commands, to generate code, to fix up our code, um, lots of command line tools for doing builds to create uh, web bundles and so on. So you're gonna need to have a good, a good terminal when you're doing your work. So I can't emphasize enough how important it is for you to get used to working in the terminal in the command line. You might think to yourself, well, you know, I'm on Windows, this isn't Linux, I'm, not, I'm gonna do everything graphically. But to work with the web, the web is the web and Unix are really closely aligned with each other, and a lot of the techniques and tools and things that we're going to do are based on doing things um, in a in a Unix style. So you're going to have to be at the command line a fair bit. Okay, so you need the browsers, you need to have the dev tools, you need to have a good terminal. What else do you need to have? Another thing that I want you to grab, and we're going to talk about this a lot, is Node.js. So this course is not specifically about writing JavaScript for server-side programming. That's what you're gonna be doing in Web 3.2.2. But I am gonna be working with Node.js a lot because we're gonna be doing a, a lot of JavaScript and one of the ways to run JavaScript is inside of Node.js. So what, what Node.js does is it takes the JavaScript engine out of Chrome, so the part of Chrome that executes and runs JavaScript, and it turns it into something that you can work with on the command line separate from the rest of a browser. So it's, it's JavaScript outside of a browsing environment. And I'm gonna be showing you even this week how to run programs using Node. So what you wanna do is you wanna to go to nodejs.org and you wanna download and install Node on your machine. You can run it on Mac, Windows, and Linux. So whatever operating system you're on, you can get it. And you're gonna find that when you do this, there's different versions of it. When I'm filming this video, currently the versions are 12.18.3 and 14.10.1. These two different versions, one called LTS and one called current. So there is a, with most software, it's like this. There is a cutting edge version of the software um, and there's a long-term stable version of the software. And so both of these would work. I would suggest you might wanna use the long-term stable version if you are really interested in some of the latest features that are coming to JavaScript and Node, you could work with uh, the newer one. Both of them are fine. So you can, you can pick whichever one you want. Um, I, jump, I have multiple versions of it installed on my machine. When you install this, you're also going to, you're also gonna get access to a, um, a command line utility called uh, NPM. So when you have Node installed, I have Node installed on my machine and I also have this tool called NPM installed on my machine. And we're gonna be working with both of these and I'll talk more about them in, in subsequent videos. But for now, what you should be able to do is you should have these installed and you should be able to run uh, Node and get the version, NPM and get the version. So you know that they're installed and everything's running as it should be. Okay, so one last thing I wanna talk about in terms of what do you need in order to develop the web and get, get started doing this work. The last thing that's really important is you need you need to have access to a really good editor. And the editor that I would like you to use in this course is Visual Studio Code. So I, I have Visual Studio Code here, and maybe you're already running Visual Studio Code on your machine. Visual Studio Code is not the same as Visual Studio. So you may be using Visual Studio to do C and C++ development, and it's a good choice for doing that kind of work. What we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be using a lighter weight editor. Visual Studio Code is great because it runs on Windows, Mac, and Linux. So it's a cross-platform tool. And interestingly enough, this editor, this desktop editor is actually written using web technologies. I can prove it to you. So if I were to run uh, the developer tools inside of so here I'm running the develop the same developer tools that I just showed you again. This is just a big uh, web page, and everything in here is it, everything in here is made with uh, is made with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, which seems crazy that you would run a entire uh, coding editor in as a web page, but that's really what it is. 
And this is actually a very common way that people build web to, uh, build desktop software because these web technologies are so powerful and so rich, we can use them to build desktop applications. And that's what they've done here. They've essentially, this is a web browser. This is another web browser, but it doesn't look like a web browser, does it? It doesn't have a back button and it doesn't have a URL bar. It's a very purpose-built browser that lets you um, work with uh, work with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, but just specifically in the context of um, writing code. So Visual Studio Code is a fantastic editor for you to use because it has a lot of features that are tailor-made for doing web development. And one of the things that I I'd like you to do as well is install a bunch of extensions. And I'll talk about these in follow-up lectures, but I wanted to mention them to you right now. So one extension that I think would be really good for you to install is a spell checker. And that's going to seem like an odd thing when you're um, when you're working on source code, but this is a fantastic thing to have in your code because all of your comments, all of the strings in your code, it's very intelligent about where it does spell checking, and it will help you catch a lot of bugs and fix up things when you're writing your code. If you're like me and you can't spell unless you have a spell checker running, um, this is a really fantastic thing to have. Another extension that I'm going to talk about a lot about is ESLint. ESLint is a tool that we use to find bugs in our code and we can integrate ESLint directly into our editor and have it automatically find and underline errors for us just the same way that spelling mistakes would be underlined. We can have it show us when we've done something wrong in our code. So that's another extension that I would encourage you to install and I'll be talking about later. And another one that I'm going to be talking about a lot is prettier. So you'll hear me tell you quite frequently how important it is that your code is formatted correctly. All the indenting is right, everything lines up the way that it should. And there are tools that can do this automatically for us. Prettier is an example. Prettier takes code that looks terrible, that has no indenting, that is all over the map, and it, it makes it, well, literally prettier. It makes it, it standardizes the way that it looks. So for you, I want you to install your install Visual Studio Code and get that editor set up. So I wanted to I wanted to talk about getting all of these tools and so on running on your machine because I want you to get set up for success as a web developer. I want you to install the browsers. I want you to install a proper terminal. I want you to uh, get all of the dev tools you can. I want you to set up an editor so that it's ready to go. I want you to have Node.js all of these different uh, pieces of software that you need in order to be successful. And we're gonna start making use of those in all of the subsequent lectures.